I think I know the answer to this question, but have any of you ever received a gift at Christmas or birthday some other time could be? Have you ever received a gift that you um, didn't use? I take that as a yes. You know, most of the time when that happens, we blame the giver, right? It's like, oh, come on now. We may not say it, but I mean, inside, it's like, really? I don't suppose any of you have ever been that giver, have you? Okay, not quite as much of a chuckle with that question. Uh, Given a gift that wasn't really all that useful. um, But, you know, sometimes... The gift is right, it meets a need, but for whatever reason, 12 months later or 12 years later, there it is still in the box. Not the giver's fault. For the last few weeks, we've been looking at the traditional themes of Advent, hope, peace, joy, and this morning will be love. Seeing each as a gift from God to this world and to each of us individually, but This year, we've been trying to take it a step further. And we've been focusing on actually using or living the gifts of Advent. And so week one, the theme of hope. In Jesus, we have the greatest possible hope. He is the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus, we are reassured that whatever our circumstances in life, that God knows, God understands, God cares, God God reveals what is needed, and God comes near to us. And that's reason for hope, whatever our circumstance might be. So our challenge in living that out is not just to hold on to hope, is not just to hold on when things get difficult ourselves, but is, is actually, and, and I was looking for, for bold words here, is actually to proclaim hope in the midst of those circumstances, to proclaim hope to the world around us, to live it loud, if you will, that there is hope centered in Jesus Christ. Similarly, the second week in Advent, in Jesus, we have the way to peace with God. We have the way to peace with one another, the way to peace within ourselves, and yet we are surrounded by wars, we are surrounded by conflict, not just between nations, but between people, between groups of people, conflict within ourselves. And I believe the call to to this gift of peace is is not only to try to somehow hold on to it and to to, to incorporate it into our lives and into our spirit, but but again, looking for a a, a strong word to, to guide us in how do we live out that gift? How do we use it? How how do we let God use it in us to to impact the world around us? Um The strongest word I came up with with was the word wage, because it's kind of a play on words there. You say wage, okay, let's put it together. I'm talking about waging peace. You think, ah, because there's so much waging war around us. And we need to be just as intentional about sowing seeds of peace. We need to be just as intentional about calling people to peace with God, about about being that peace between other people where we can, about making sure that we are right with other people where we can, and and making sure that we are centered and settled within our own spirits because of Christ. So we need to seek to, to proclaim hope. We need to seek to wage peace in the world around us. Third week was joy. In Jesus, we have the greatest cause for joy. You know, the word gospel means good news. Jesus brought good news of a kingdom that is unlike any earthly kingdom, a kingdom built on grace and truth. The angel told the shepherds that this good news would be a source of great joy for all people. So how do we how do we live out that gift? Not by keeping the lid on the box. 
Oh, but this is church. You're supposed to keep the lid on the box when you come to church, right? Maybe not. Although I'm mindful of how we tried to raise our kids. I'm not sure how successful we were, but, you know, the mantra was always, if you're going to act out, do it at home. Not out in public. And there's a part of me that wants to say, not as a way of scolding this congregation, but a way of acknowledge that we all have room to go, grow, to say, if we're going to be sour, if, if we're not going to radiate the joy that God has provided for us through Christ, well, at the very least, let's, let's be sour here, not out there. <laughs> you understand? But I really don't want, want us to be sour here because we need to practice. We need to encourage each other. We need it to be contagious. So those of, those of us who are doing pretty well with this joy thing, need to, we, we need it to rub off. We need to create space for that and create permission to express that joy. What kind of testimony is it for Christ we walk around and, and, and there's no joy in our life. There's no joy radiating from us. I don't mean putting something on that's fake. And I acknowledged last week, this one doesn't come as easy for me as some of the others do. Remember I talked about, yeah, I kind of would rather change the words to the, that chorus and say, I have joy like a river. I can do that. But the song doesn't say that. It says, I have joy like a fountain. And a fountain's supposed to kind of bubble up, and it's like, you were here last week, I admit it, nobody's ever accused me of being a fountain. <laughs> but I want to grow. I want to grow more fountain-like. Not just put on something that's fake, but from in here. And whatever there might be that keeps it from coming out, I, I want to be freed from that. And so we talked about some steps in, in working at that. Step number one was, was to acknowledge that we have room to grow. And my hand was up first. I didn't actually ask for your hands to go up, so I had an advantage there. But, uh. And then we need to, to focus our minds on God's call to joy, that this is something that God asks of us, that God commands us in his word to, to express, to reflect, to radiate that joy. Thirdly, we need, to, we need to focus our minds on the causes God has given us for joy, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. And it doesn't mean, we're, it doesn't mean we, we ignore the pain of this life. But there can be a joy that's underneath and around that. There can still be something that people look at us and say, well, after all you've been through, how, how can you have hope? How can you have peace? How can you radiate joy? And we can give an answer. As Peter writes, for the hope that we have within us that, that makes all that difference. Fourth, we can focus our minds less on ourselves. <laughs> That's where some of the hang-ups, oh, what's it going to look like? What are people going to think? What? Focus our mind less on ourselves. And lastly, as I said, we can create more space, more room, more permission for people to express joy so that maybe, maybe it can be contagious and rub off. Well, this is all review so far. I know not all of you have been here every week, but, but today we come to the theme, the gift of love. Really at the center of it all. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And of course, that, that kind of reinforces maybe the first thing we need to talk about here, and that is in order to live out this gift, we have to have it first. God loved, so he gave. And he gave knowing that we were going to have a choice to whether we receive that gift or not or whether it stays on the shelf. He gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him, whoever receives that gift, whoever takes him into their life might not perish but have everlasting life. The scripture we read together earlier from John chapter 1, same gospel, 
talks about how, how Christ came into the very world he created, but the world didn't even recognize him. We, we can't live out his love if we've not recognized who he is and owned that personally as, as the eternal son of God. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. You see, we have a choice to make here personally, individually. To recognize him, to receive him. And, and, and the writer goes on to say here, but to all who believed him, to those who received him, he gave the right to become children of God, to, to come into relationship with him through Christ. We can't live out the gift of, of the love of Christ if we haven't received it to begin with. To recognize, to receive, to believe, all those are words that describe a personal relationship with God through Christ. But that's not the end, that's the beginning. And then we are called not only to receive God's gift of love, but to let it transform us so that we are living it out. So how do we do that? What's our word for today? Well, I ran through several. Show love, seemed a little weak. Demonstrate love, express love, all kind of the same. You've got your bulletin. You saw where I landed. Embody love. And that came to mind and it's like, yeah, how could I have not thought of that before? That's the Christmas story, isn't it? Embody. Incarnation. We use that word sometimes. We talk about someone embodying a certain quality, good or bad. We talk about some quality and, and we say, well, yeah, his picture could be in the dictionary next to that word. That's <laughs> so what we mean by embodying, that, that just everything about this person speaks that quality. And, of course, at Christmas time, we think of how God came in the flesh how the word became flesh, embodied all that God is in a body so that we look at Jesus and the record of his life, of his ministry, of his teachings. We look at Jesus and we say, yeah, that's God. That's God. I see him more clearly Interesting in this John passage, there two things stood out. I've read this passage hundreds of times. Two things especially stood out this year. One was the connection here between the part where it says, the word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. Jesus' life brought light made it possible. That's what light does. Light makes it possible to see. Jesus made it possible to see God in a new way, in a deeper way. And so just a few phrases later, it says, so the word became human, made his home among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory is of the one and only of, from the Father, full of grace and truth. He came in a body, the word became flesh and we saw. His life was light to illuminate who God is, what God is like, and we could see more clearly than ever before. So how are we called? How are we called to, to live out this gift? To embody love? Oh, that people would look at us and say, that's love. Oh, that people would look at us and say, that's God. Not in the ways that sometimes we try to be. No, see, it's so much deeper and richer and more marvelous than that. First, I want to share a, 
something that I came across, Facebook said seven years ago. What Facebook didn't know is that they were going to remind me of something I'd use in my sermon today. I don't think that was on purpose. Supposedly comes from the Book of Common Prayer, and I tried to research this more, and I really didn't find it. I don't have a copy of that, and I thought, you know, I'd like to get a copy of it. It's, it's really thick, and I thought, how am I going to find this? But I trust the source who said that's where it came from, and it's kind of, you find it in a lot of different places, but it's a simple prayer. But it kind of relates to this idea of embodying love, embodying Christ, where people look at us and see him. It says simply this, Lord, if we are to be afraid of anything, well, that's pretty broad. If there's anything in this whole universe that we're going to be afraid of, let it be this. Let it be the fear of not committing ourselves fully to you. Let us fear that the day will pass without our having lightened the load of another. Let us fear, and here's the big one, let us fear that someone will come looking for you and find only us. Let us fear that someone will come looking for you and find only us. How did Jesus embody the love of the Father? I think of some of the statements that Jesus himself made. I have come. The Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve. That's part of what embodying Christ's love looks like. You know, that part didn't end there. It went on to say and to give his life a ransom for many. Embodying love involves a willingness to lay down our lives and to live that way. When people look at us, they, they see that depth. They see that richness. Son of man came to seek and to save that which is lost. I have come to give you life, to give it more abundantly. You see how everything was was this outward flow of life, an outward flow of, of trying to reach out, trying to draw in, trying to, to, to bring life, trying to bring rescue, trying to redeem. Philippians 2, a familiar passage, Paul puts it this way. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Though he was God. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave. And was born as a human being. The word became flesh. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. How are we to embody love? Have the same attitude as Christ. The passage goes on to say, Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor, gave him the name that is above all all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But our attitude, the glory belongs to him. Our attitude is to have the same mind, the same attitude that we too seek to embody Christ living in us. We collectively part of the body of Christ in this world now and collectively that they look at us. Our greatest fear is that people should come among us looking for Jesus. 
and see only us. You know, I told you that two things stood out to me this year as I reflected on this passage. The one was just that connection between the language of Christ coming to give light to everyone and right after that we have seen because of his coming. We've seen God's glory. The second one really wasn't directly from a particular phrase in that passage. It was more a question as I, actually just this morning, as I thought, oh, it's Christmas morning. I've been doing a little bit less of this lately, and there's reason for that. We can talk about it, so it's kind of related to what I'm about to say this morning. I thought, yeah, it's nice. Everyone's, you know, this is Christmas morning. We kind of have that expectation that, you know, we wear lots of red uh, as a Christmas color, and that, and you all look great. And um, and I thought, how odd. That at Christmas of all times, that we dress up a little more than normal. To celebrate a God, a king who did give up his throne. The God who did set aside all of that to become human, and not just human, but to be born in a stable of all places. Somehow our Sunday best, up a notch to be our Christmas best, seems to not quite fit. And I thought about leaving you with something that would help you to remember that. And then I'm second guessing myself and I'm sitting there and then then David's team, I knew they were struggling with what to choose. I didn't know what they wound up with. And, and then I'm reflecting on those songs, as I just quoted, how many kings would abandon their thrones, and then the next one, he shall reign, reminding us who, who this Jesus is. And then going from that, into you know, the simplicity and beauty of Silent Night. And I just pretty much sat there and mouthed the words because it's kind of hard to cry and sing at the same time. (laughs) And I thought, yeah, it kind of is that stark. Going from he shall reign to that silent night in the stable. And so I don't mean this for show in any way this morning. It's just what was kind of on my heart, and this is just, this is not scandalous or anything, but I just feel like I need to get rid of the jackets and probably even the tie. It's not work clothes, but maybe it's something a little more down to earth. Because love is supposed to be down to earth. Incarnation is about coming down to earth for our sakes. And if this could help us remember a little bit that Christmas is more about embodying love, embodying Christ, being willing to be down to earth, to get down where other people are, being willing to wash feet, to do whatever it takes to be Christ to other people, to remove barriers, to be down to earth. It's much more about wearing a casual sweater than it is about dressing up. May God help us as his children, as his church, to proclaim hope, to wage peace, to radiate joy, and to embody love. Not just at Christmas, but all throughout the coming year.